Ok. Okay, this has started. Uh, hi, Sebastian. Shall I make you our account a co-host? Uh, that would be great. Yeah. So the one which is Sebastian or... Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so maybe you, you can start recording and then we, we can start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm... Okay. I think we can start now, right? Yes. So welcome everyone. Uh, we're happy to have uh, Kohei Kamada to talk to us about the Lorentzian description of the first order phase transition. Okay, shall I start? Okay. Uh, sure. Thank you sure. very Go much ahead. for the. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you very much for the kind invitation for this excellent workshop. Uh, yeah, it is a great honor to me to give a talk on the my recent studies on Lorentz and, and vacuum decay. So this talk is based on the work with Takumi Hayashi and Narita Osta and Jinji Okoyama. And the, especially the Takumi Hayashi and Narita Osta did a great job on this this uh, project and yeah, Takumi, Takumi is a PhD student at the Yokoyama group and the uh, Naitaka was the postdoc at uh, Liken in, in near Tokyo. So, okay, let me start. Okay, so yeah, the message of this talk is that, as you know, first of the phase transition is of interest for cosmology literally. And yeah, we often use the Euclid, Euclidean formula and it has been developed and often adopted. But uh, yeah, in some way, I will, I will explain, but Lorentzian description would be desirable. And we adopt the Polyakov-like action for the bubble wall. It makes us possible to describe the system as one-dimensional quantum mechanics, mechanics system. And uh, we can analyze it in the Lorentzian space. And with the help of the Left test theory, which has been mentioned by the, in the, the talk by Professor Neil Tirok, but uh, we adopted it. And then those which correspond to the, the bound structure. So that we have the exponential separation factor for the vacuum decay rate, and uh, yeah, it has been evaluated. Okay, my talk is uh, organized as follows. I first introduce what is the first order phase transition and what is the motivation for the our, our work. And then I will explain how the system can be described by the projection like action and then how to evaluate, how to formulate the Lorentz path integral. And then the, in order to evaluate Lorentz path integral, we need to have some computational technique. And then we indeed we used so called Picard theory to evaluate it. And then uh, uh, we, I, I Conclude my talk with the discussion. Okay, uh, let me start. So first transition, uh, it is also the case associated with the spontaneous symmetry breaking. is a key ingredient in field theory and particle physics. Yeah, so it is often the case in the case we study the weak coupled system, the phase transition is described by the, the like in the transition of the scalar field with such a potential. And then, so yeah, we have many symmetries uh, or desired symmetries in the standard model or beyond. So our universe, in the real universe, we could have uh, experienced almost definitely electronic symmetry breaking and possibly grand unified solid uh, breaking. Or, we might have some other BSM symmetry break. So what is interesting is that if 
the symmetry breaking is fast order. Then it is associated with double nucleation, expansion, and collision. At that time, we have gravitational waves emitted like this, or baryon space is generated, so called uh, through the electric baryogenesis. Or we might expect for the magnetic field generation, which is related to the yesterday's talk by Professor Zitrinsky. So, yeah, so from the uh, astrophysical cosmological observations, we might find, we might be able to find such a signature that, and it could be the, the chance to predict beyond the sun model. And then we, then, so as I said, the, the, if the symmetry breaking is first order, it is associated with bubble nucleation and expansion and collision. But the, so the how bubble nucleation is described. So yeah, indeed, so it is analyzed as a quantum tunneling, and we know there is a very good paper by Korman and Kevin Korman. So as, as it is, so there uh, as as follows. So what we like to calculate is that the transition amplitude between the from the first vacuum to true vacuum for the uh, expectation values. But we know that we can go to the imaginary time by with the weak rotation so that the vacuum transition rate can be evaluated as by the third point solution or bound solution of the, the field dynamics which is the uh, uh, awful type in the, in, in the vacuum. We go to the awful, we assume awful symmetries and go inverse potential and go down, go try to find the bounce solution. And evaluating bounce action, we can have the, the exponential factor and the, evaluating the quantum fluctuation around this solution, we evaluate the, the overall factor A. And in this case, the, for the, size of the bubble is determined by this bound solution. And we, we often call it critical bubble. Uh, but are we satisfied with this description? Yeah, indeed, there are some times no. So if, for example, what is the question is what is, what happens in the real time? So we are in the fourth vacuum, then around the, the presentation time, bubble is new created, Expand and another bubble is new created. Then another bubble is new created and expand. Expand. Then, but the question is that bubbles with critical radius imagined in the space instantaneously. If this is true, as the bubble core, the field value of the, the order parameter or the scale, scale field jumps. At the time of the field transition. If, for example, but there are some questions. If there are fields that couple to phi and this phi field gives mass to this chi field, then the mass of the chi, chi field also jumps. Then, so as we know, that the, once the, the mass changes, the vacuum structure for the chi field change, and so we expect the particular production. Yeah, this is also related. So there are some mention uh, in the, yesterday the Professor Janinsky talked about uh, so how much they are produced. This could be an uh, interesting talk in, in the industry subject. And also conceptual problem in the Euclidean formula exist. Yeah, the, especially when we include gravity. The formalism that includes gravity is developed by Coleman and Derucha, as we know, with keeping the, uh, the Euclidean approach. But indeed, once we take into, we introduce the gravity, the validity of weak rotation is not clear because the, the space that can cover would, would, be different, would be different. So how we can match the, the, match the, the Euclidean time and Euclidean time. And also negative model problem is known. And the choice of the state is also an interesting topic. So the, yeah, as we know, in the coverage time, we do not have the, the, the unique Vacuum, vacuum state. So the choice of the state is important. And yeah, it is related to the next talk by Professor Luis Gregory, but in the, in the case of the, the 
the transition around the black holes. We might have the, the, the Ulu state or Hadler Hawking state, and how it is implemented in the Euclidean form. Yeah, it is a certain point. Yeah, this has been also addressed by Andre. Andre um, so then the question can this issue be resolved if we can evaluate transition amplitude in real time directly? And so the yeah, indeed, so the reason we adopted UK formalism is that Lorentz calculation is very hard. So but, but recently there is a good paper by uh, Professor Newton Tilok and with uh, and his collaborators but, uh, to, to the Lorentz cosm cosmology. So try to adopt that method. This is our direction. So uh, and indeed I, I don't mean to, to say that the uh, this uh, this is our, we are the first to address this problem, but yeah, indeed the Hamiltonian approach with the precarious explanation has been also been studied. So let me mention on that. Yeah, and uh, let me give a comment. So that this is all the motivation for our study. But unfortunately, so and indeed, as we, I really explained, we succeeded in formulating and obtaining interesting new insights, but not succeeded in resolving these issues. So the, this would be the feature I, I, as I will explain. Okay, then, so let me go, go inside the, how to, to uh, explain uh, how to uh, calculate, uh, how to evaluate for the pathogen diagram, uh, how to evaluate transition amplitude with the Lorentz pathogen diagram. Okay, so then in order to, to perform with such a calculation, let, let, let me first specify what kind of setup we, are in, we have in mind. So we have in mind the, the action with the canonical scalar, canonical kinetic term with the potential with something like that, false vacuum and true vacuum. And so, and with some, some general, to, to, for the, some generalization, we assume that the background space time is to this background. And uh, we adopt the static coordinate uh, with L to be the dot radius. And, and indeed, we do not solve the, the, okay, the uh, dynamics of metric. So the gravity is static. And then, so what we would like to evaluate is the uh, transition amplitude in the Laurentian path integral. So the, this is a, the bracket form expectation. But so what we shall do is that the, we can we can perform the, the we can take the integral of the five field like this. But unfortunately, this is an infinite dimensional path integral, so it is hard to perform computation. Then, so one way to resolve this problem is to go to minimum superspace. I mean that the, we so the from the, the infinite. Uh, scale, scale of your degree of freedom to go to restrict to the theory, but to be one or final dimension. And it is often the case we adopt so called the uh, symbol approximation. But, uh, no, but, but indeed, we know the way to keep some kinetic term or dynamics of the symbol approximation. So in the, so in the Euclidean approach, we often also use the symbol approximation. But that we do not solve the dynamics of the symbol and the wall. But if we adopt that go to action, then it would be possible to describe the, the dy wall dynamics. Yeah, indeed, so now go to now go to action is uh, is described by this as follows. So we have the bubble, and then bubble can be, be can be described by the tension in the. the in the world and the energy de energy density difference in the inside the, the bubble. And then we by and the, we can have the bubble volume of the XME field here on the on the bubble. Then the we can write down the induced metric as well. And now go to action is indeed given like this. So the, this is the the number got of action we often have. And in, inside the bubble, we have the, the, the energy deposit in, inside, so we add this time. And then 
assuming that the spectral symmetry, the the world volume can be described. Here, T, theta phi is identified to the, the dark, dark coordinate itself, but the, the bubble radius is the, the function of time. So, and it, so yeah, Euclidean approach on, in this, uh, in, in this setup, in this simplification has been indeed developed by uh, in old, old case, past good blanket paper has been appeared almost 30 years ago. And recently, uh, I and Dreves also studied in this research. I limited it, uh, described the vacuum transition with, in terms of the number of action. Yeah, and it has been pointed out that the vacuum decay is described by quantum tunneling of the bubble radius from the zero to the critical bubble. But the, these two papers focus on the uh, use the Euclidean approach. So we've considered if we can directly use it in the, the, to evaluate the number of quarter action with the Lorentz description. Unfortunately, when some difficulty arises, so because the, the, kinetic, the kinetic time is not canonical in the number of quarter action, so it is hard to describe. And but the, so yeah, so it is not suitable for the Lorentz description. It's a very for the, the method by, by Tirok and his company. Then we consider Polyakov type, type action would help. Yeah, indeed, it helped. The difference between the Polyakov type action and the Goto type action is the, the treatment of the, the induced metric. So we introduced the auxiliary in, induced metric on the wall, and then so, and the Polyakov action is given like this. And here, the, in order to, to, to adopt the Tirox and his company uh, way, we use the world volume to be the T and N here. And then, then the project type action can be parameterized like this. So the, now the, we have the kinetic, uh, the chemical kinetic time. Then, so, the, so now, now we succeeded in describing the, the System is slightly uh, uh, chemically with, with two variables of variable. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I forgot to say that I, I introduced last function here in the metric. So we have the the, the system is described by T, R, and N. So the, and the, it becomes finite dimension. Then if the the, the um, equation motion for this action with boundary condition. Are uh, zero to some finite value of R1 would have the classical solution. It would be it determines the bubble nucleation rate with radius R1, color R1, but it does not exist. So in, in order to deal with this problem, we first perform the path integral with respect T and R to get the total solution of T and R and the function of tau and N. So either the tau is the uh, dark, uh, but, but, uh, and then, yeah, that is, uh, by performing that, you go, the path integral becomes just the, the, the integral for the lap n. Okay, then let me turn to the evaluation of the vacuum decay rate with Picaro Lipschitz theory. So practically, we can evaluate the subtle solution for T and R by performing the, the um, derivative. Uh, Adopting the, the, the derivative with respect to R and T. And by, by taking the derivative with respect to R, we get the conservation equation for the Hamiltonian. And indeed, the T, the, the Polyakov action does depend on T. So the, 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 the derivative with respect to, to T gives the, the the determination of t dot function of r by and by looking t dot equal zero at r equal zero because we like to describe the vacuum transition rate from the from the nothing. So then, if this values one to one correspondence between the Hamiltonian H and the, the another uh, another the, the coordinate of r, as can t dot become zero. Then in this now it is apparent that 
translate for not only the critical bubble, but also bubble with arbitrary radius can be evaluated. And at, after some computation, we get such a computation. So we've given, given Hamiltonian and sigma is R squared. We explain it like this. And so this could be the, and Rosero is uh, the critical bubble in the, for the Minkowski space time or the, for the L equals zero. Sorry, L equals infinity. Then, so yeah, now we are ready to calculate the transition amplitude. And indeed, so the, so yeah, now by, by requiring, by setting Hamiltonian, we can determine R1 and evaluate it. But integral is highly oscillatory on real n. Then, so with the complex analysis, we can find the appropriate path in order to evaluate this integral with the, in the complex term. And in this so the calculation theory would be the, the powerful tool to identify the Riemann third point. So let me explain what is the calculation theory. Okay, I would like to evaluate the integral in this, in this uh, path C on the area. But it is oscillatory. Then we can find the critical points in S that satisfies the S their N to be zero. So here I put the Riemann N to. Then um, draw the steepest descent line. That is the, so for the real IS. So here the, it means that the, the steepest ascent line is the line to, to go the, the steep, uh, at the, 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 yeah, steep to that, that goes to, to the critical point. And then, so we can write the such a uh, infinite lines of the steepest ascent line and identify that See such a steep uh, critical point whose step is the ascent line past uh, original counter. Then we can draw the speed of descent line that go, goes the steepest line to for the from the NS like this. In this point, we can deform the counter along the steepest descent line. So we can first go change the, the counter like this that to, so that it passes the critical uh, critical point and then it goes to like this so and we know the, if the, the other s is analytical and yeah, we know that the singularity then we can perform without any difficulty such a deformation and along this steepest this ascent uh, steepest descent line the this has uh, the maximum point in, along this line. So we can, we, we can adopt the Gaussian approximation. So as long as this dashed line path, integral of the dashed line, line, line path is negligible or uh, evaluated, can be evaluated appropriately, then the, this integral can be evaluated by the, the Gaussian approximation around the, this critical point. So this is the essence of the risk theory. Okay, then now we, I'm ready to uh, evaluate the transient amplitude. So for the critical bubble formation, I put the, so now, now uh, I found, uh, we found the critical point given like this. Rho B is given like this and, uh, and critical bubble size in the Mikoski back, uh, no, just the background. And then we found this point. And we draw the steepest ascent line from the each, each uh, critical point. And indeed, it is found that only, only, only this critical point, uh, only, only the, the steepest ascent line that, that, that from this critical point passes the original counter. And, other, and the 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 descent line is found to be like this. And we found the we found the integral from here here to here it, it vanishing as, as, uh, by performing with the I epsilon from treatment at the, the infinity here. But anyway, then we can evaluate the path integral 
here. And we found that the, the exponential separation factor is like this. And indeed, the, this is the similar structure to the column modular instant. So, and obtain the same exponent to the UPN computation. So yeah, we are happy. It's okay. But the, how powerful our treatment is. That is, so in the Euclidean past integral formalism, we can just calculate the vacuum tra uh, transaction that corresponds to the critical bubble. But as I said, by changing the Hamiltonian, we can, we can find the, the sort of solution that determines the, the formation of the arbitrary radius. And for the larger bar, larger bar formation, now the uh, SP and R, R1 correspond to the, the determination of Hamiltonian. And by, performing, by parameterizing R1 to be P, and we found that the southern point is goes to, to uh, deviated from the imaginary axis, axis. And so now we have this, this uh, critical point. And again, we found the best ascent line uh, path in this, in, in, in this part. Then, so the, we found that this critical point is a unique critical point that is responsible for the path integral. And then the, the best descent line is evaluated this line. And again, the we can confirm that the integral from the negative imaginary infinity to the positive in real infinity will vanish, it vanish. Then the we can just evaluate the, the, the third point around here. And again, and surprisingly, we found that the, the exponent of the, the exponential suppression is the same to the critical bubble. Okay, you have five more minutes. Okay, good, thanks. And okay, so let, let me, so please postpone to explaining the physical meaning of that. But so, okay, for the smaller bubble nucleation can be also evaluated. In this case, the third point is still in the imaginary axis, but yeah, separated like this. And then again, we find the steepest ascent line. Only, only the, the, the steepest ascent line from this critical point passes through the, the original counter. So we determine that this critical point is the responsible other point for the vacuum uh, decay. Then, and the the descent line counter is under that. And again, the passive uh, integral in, in integral from the here to here would be, be, be vanishing this small, so we can neglect it. And then, so here we find the, the such a, uh, uh, enhancement of a nucleation rate. Okay, so then the, now, now we have the uh, exponent for the, or the separation factor of the, the vacuum decay rate is in terms of the bubble size P. And we find that the critical bubble formation rate is derived, which is equivalent, it is the same to the Euclidean um, evaluation. And larger bubble formation rate is the same to the, the critical bubble formation rate. We, are, we interpret it at, is as the critical bubble formation followed by the classical classical dependence. So it, I think it is reasonable. For the smaller bubble nucleation, we have the smaller separation factor. This means that the larger nucleation rate. But such a bubble cannot exist classically. So I, we think they are virtually formed and turn back to R equals zero, and so it does not appear in the real time. Okay, so yeah, let me uh, stop with the discussion. So what we, so, yeah, what we have done is that vacuum decay rate in the digital background is investigated in the Laurentian method. 
and that, which, that is made possible by adopting the quantum mechanism of the bulb radius with the polyacrylic action. And Picard Reef's theory, the relevant subtle points are identified, and the decay rate of the, for the bulb with the arbitrary radius is evaluated. But we don't think that this is the, the we have sufficiently uh, good result yet. So there are many things not yet done. For example, so we consider the, the background of the space time, but we do not take into account the back reaction to the metric by the bubble nucleation. So in such, in this case, so the first of the, the uh, far, far, one of the main motivation for us that the non the implication on the, the block, black hole catalyzed vacuum decay, which will be explained in the next talk, is we do not have such an uh, implication on that. And we did not evaluate carefully on the, the coefficient of the, the decay rate. And so, but, but the most important point of the, the, the the negative model, so called negative model problem arises in the, this evaluation. So it is, so this thing should be done. And yeah, at some point, we, what we find is at some point in the, the not in, in on the real axis. So yeah, the first motivation for one of the first motivation for us is what happened in the real space time. But the, the, we have this other point in the, not in the real axis. So it is not clear what happens still in real time dynamics. Okay, thank you very much, that's all. Thank you, Koshe. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, questions? We have lots of time to, to discuss. Andre, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, Koshe. Hey, um, I see you. It's so, so dark. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. So uh, I, I have a question about this uh, uh, fact that you actually have a you know family of uh, bubbles of different sizes, right? So, uh, so did I understand correctly that uh, so you actually have one free parameter, right, which is H or, or R, and I mean the the one-to-one -one correspondence to each other, uh, and then you can evaluate this uh, transition rate at any value of R or at any value of H. So, uh, and uh, and then you yeah. get like different, yeah. But but then uh, I'm, I'm a bit confused. How how does it match with the standard uh, Euclidean uh, formalism? Because uh, so as far as I understand, you work in in, in the sitter uh, space, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and then it is kind of clear uh, what is going on because uh, in the sitter space, I can adopt this uh, equation formalism and I can say, okay, uh, it looks like a thermal bus. So I can really, you know, with some, uh, that is a bit tricky, right? Because that's not, uh, that's not space time, but I can go to Euclidean uh, time if I define it properly. And there, if I, uh, furthermore, work in the symbol approximation because uh, you here work in the symbol approximation. In principle, uh, and and it's a general statement, right? If I work in the symbol approximation, I expect to get uh, not a single solution, but I expect to get some, you know, a family of solutions which are parameterized by some uh, parameter, which is a, which I can say that it is an energy. Uh, in this um, picture, in the symbol approximation, where I think of the ball coordinate, you know, as a particle moving in some effective potential, and then I have some free parameter, which just comes from classical mechanics, right? The energy of the particle or something, and I can associate it with the Hamiltonian. And, and, and this is like uh, the standard situation that I, I have some family of configurations, but then uh, I would say that I should actually choose uh, so I have this family of configuration, but only one configuration is, is an actual tunneling solution. And to choose this correct configuration, I should just look at uh, the boundary conditions. I should look at, uh, you know, boundary conditions provided by the vacuum state. And in the case of the sitter, uh, since we have this uh, thermal interpretation of the sitter, and uh, we know that we can go to Euclidean time and there, uh, this boundary conditions uh, will be just thermal boundary conditions. So they will just tell me that uh, my solution uh, has to be periodic in Euclidean time with a certain period, right? And this actually fixes 
the value of, of this uh, three parameter. So th this fixes uh, the, the unique uh, value of H uh, or unique uh, unique solution, and I get unique tunnel solution. Uh, and I'm a bit confused mm. how how this uh, how this matches your approach because in your approach it looks like indeed so you also work in the symbol approximation so it is not surprising that you get this one parameter family of configurations but then I would just say that uh, uh, you have one uh, you have one configuration still uh, one configuration which is true tunnel and solution right but to select this you should somehow impose uh, boundary conditions. And uh, uh, and it, it is not uh, quite clear how, how how you do this in the case of this uh, Lorentz and Lorentz and path integral because uh, this con condition of periodicity it's kind of it doesn't emerge naturally or at least you you didn't show how it emerges naturally and, and fixes the, the, this uh, this solution. So I hope yeah, you. Okay, so, yeah. yeah. So in that what we did is that so then yeah. So I'm not sure if I can can give the, the satisfactory answer, but the, now, now you you would agree that the, the now, now the system is described n and t and r and performing the, the and the, we can we can have the solution sort of part with respect to r and, and t. Yes, yes. And sure. then we we find that the, the we we have the, the we 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 ha have the the degree of freedom to choose how many times. So this is the integration constant. So we have the, yes. the and yes. then and and the by by taking the derivative by performing the particular for t if t dot is determined in terms of uh, in a t t dot t is we have a shift of symmetry of t so the actual value of t is not important but t dot is important and t dot is is becomes the function of the uh, of the other uh, solution, and then, then, and we require that uh, so the vacuum transition should be de described r, r equals zero to some finite value, and then That's so right. we require t dot t dot equal to be zero and r equals zero, and then so the for the critical but so the but we have the, the free of the freedom of the choice of h and yes. one one uh, appropriate choice of h. Give the, the critical value, but they, by changing the, the age, we have other uh, other points that, that we can t dot equal zero. And so this is, my, 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 my yeah. question is how how does it match right. uh, the Euclidean picture where you actually yeah, know then, that you have one? Yeah, 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 yeah. Then then so yeah, we so in that sense, so what we we have found by calculation and by looking at the calculation, we we. We 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 do not have the more much more concrete com comparison to the Euclidean approach. But from this from this uh, result, we we might be able to identify that so for the, the larger radius can be also generated in the Euclidean formula because the, by Euclidean formula we first generate the critical bubble. But the, by going to the drawing time, we start to expand. So the, even in the Euclidean um, Euclidean formalism. We eventually get to the larger bubble, right? So then, so we we ident we un we interpreted that the the exponent is the same because th this describes the dynamics. The the, ah, the bubble see, is so, so, and, so, and expanded. But but, oh, but, but the, the yeah this is, this would be a kind of educated guess, and we do not have ah. much more or con concrete comparison yet. Yeah, but it will be done. Guys, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we have another question. So maybe if the discussion oh, yeah, can continue in a yeah, breakout yeah, sure, room. Sure, so, sure. Alessandro, please go yeah. ahead because we're running out of time. That's why. Ah, yeah. Hey. Hello. So the other question so is about the old issue that bubble can appear with any speed. Uh, no, that uh, uh, some people say you should integrate over the Lorentz group uh, and get uh, then infinite. Mm -hmm. uh, no, and. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, the, no, maybe the critical bubble is Lorentz invariant, so people argue this should not be done. But uh, your smaller bubbles uh, uh, probably are not Lorentz invariant. Uh, yeah, so in that sense, yeah, indeed we didn't check, but so if our, if our interpretation is correct, so the larger bubble is correspond to the, the Euclidean form of critical bubble nucleation and going to, to the 
the, the classical, classical Lorentz time expansion, then the, we, we should be able to the, the bubble ball velocity in the Euclidean time form rhythm and compare it with the, with, with the, the our full Lorentzian um, uh, investigation. So, but, but we didn't. Yeah, it, it is a good, nice insight. So, but, but we, I do not have much more comment on that. Sorry. Does it satisfy with you? Satisfy them? Okay, thank for you. you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Very good. So, if there are no more questions, I think we can move to the next talk uh, by Ruth Gregory. Uh, that will be about primordial black holes and vacuum decay. If you want, you can share Hello. your screen. Is it, is it working? Am I? Uh, I we can see screen. you, we hear you. But uh, yeah, Super. No, no screen it's yet. a good start. <laughs> um, I'm speaking from a rather rustic environment now. Where do I oh, share screen? Let me see. So do you normally just share the PowerPoint? Um, and let me see, start, play from start. Is this great? Uh, great. Okay, Perfect. good. Yeah. Excellent. So just let me know when to start. Please go ahead. Okay. Well, thanks for asking me to, to talk and, and to join the meeting. I'm sort of in a slight conflict of meetings, but I think this talk follows on perfectly from the last one, um, from what I've gathered. And I, I think that some of the questions raised about, you know, the Euclidean method, I'll kind of come back to here. And um, I think this is something that's a sort of really interesting question, but I'm going to be using um, the sort of standard tools and techniques in the standard way um, to come to a particular conclusion. I've had several collaborators on this, but the ones relevant for, for the sort of content of this talk are Philip Burda, Ian Moss, and Ben Withers. Oh, how do I get my, ah, okay. <laughs> so um, it's only half an hour, so I have to be fairly brief. But essentially, the, the, the topic of the talk is vacuum decay and in the context of the standard model Higgs. And whilst this st it's still a little bit up in the air because more recent analyses of ATLAS and CMS seem to be pushing the mass of the top quark down, there's still very much uh, open possibility that at high energies, the Higgs self-coupling becomes negative, so which means that we are not living in, in a real vacuum, but rather a false vacuum, some metastable state. And so this is the sort of standard uh, plot of the uh, quartic coupling and how it runs at large scales. And I think when this was first noticed, people were fairly sanguine about it because if you use the standard techniques, um, you got an insanely, um, high half-life for the lifetime of the universe of 10 to the 139 years or so. Um, but in this talk, I'm just gonna be giving the message that actually it's not the full story. If you look at the decay of a vacuum and you take into account gravity, which is this uh, Coleman de Lucia method, uh, then you have to follow it to its logical conclusion and take in um, other gravitational effects. And in this particular case, black holes, and it turns out black holes change the calculation uh, drastically. So um, just as a quick outline, I'm just gonna review the Coleman method um, and then I'll add a black hole and compare to evaporation, which leads to that conclusion. So um, I, it, I know it was developed not just by Coleman, but I guess Coleman de Lucia was where I learned this process. But the 1970s seemed to be a very rich period uh, in developing our understanding of field theory and gravity. And uh, we sort of understand the vacuum as an effective state defined by the minimum of potential, um, in our case, the Higgs. But of course, this potential depends on temperature and scale, which leads to all sorts of interesting effects in the early universe. But I'm thinking about now more. And so at the at the bottom, there's just a sort of little graph illustrating how potentials can change um, as you sort of change the temperature, and it gives rise to this idea of metastability. 
So this terminology of false vacuum is really just saying that you're in a local but not a global minimum. And you would expect that there's some sort of tunneling process, as indeed you've just been hearing about, to the true minimum, um, or at least to some exit point. And this gives a first order phase transition, um, as again, you've been hearing about with bubbles. So the sort of standard um, method that we use to describe this is a Euclidean method. We, we rotate the system to Euclidean time. We solve the Euclidean equations of motion. This is identifying a saddle point of the path integral. We then calculate the difference between the action of this um, uh, configuration with, the, with a, the bubble in it compared to the background. And we say this is the action of the instant on and then we exponentiate it to get the leading order expression for the probability of tunneling. Um, I think quite a good intuitive picture, um, which is not, it's sort of related to the Euclidean method, but it, it perhaps is more, more general. And that is what I call a Goldilocks one, which is this idea that, you, again, you've just been hearing about if a bubble nucleate fluctuates into existence, if it's too small, it's too much surface area, it recollapse. Um, if it's too large, it's, you know, the bigger it gets, the more expensive it is to form. And there's a sort of just right bubble which it won't recollapse, but it's just on the cusp of, um, of expanding and cheap enough to form. So um, this, this is sort of, you know, giving this, this is putting some numbers or, or equations to this balancing of the budget. Um, so the cost of the interface, so between, we, we, we make a bubble and, and we have one vacuum energy outside, a different one inside. We have a cost because they're separated by a wall. And that cost is just the area of the wall times its energy per unit area. The energy gain is the difference in the vacuum energies times the volume of the bubble. And so this is kind of Coleman's intuitive argument where you um, make the solution stationary with respect to R and then plug it back in and get the action. And so this gives a very straightforward way of estimating uh, what the action is and how it depends on the various quantities, which will be determined by the full field theory. Um, and it gives a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, approximation to this. So as I said, you get the amplitude for tunneling by exponentiating this. So that's the sort of idea of the um, the sort of standard methods. But I, I think the question that was being explored previously was, what does this really mean? And does it mean anything real? Um, the conventional answer is to go back to um, Lorentzian time, where you see that the, uh, the bubble, the sphere, uh, transforms into a hyperboloid. So you get this idea, the bubble forms, and then it expands rapidly. And then I guess the way I was taught to do this by, by Gibbons and Hawking is you, you cut this uh, picture into at the moment of time symmetry. So, and, and glue, is, uh, glue a sort of Euclidean part to the Lorentzian part. And because you've cut it at a point where the instanton is, has no time, is sort of static with respect to time, these two, uh, solutions patched together. So it sort of seems as if the Euclidean picture has some validity, but I'm, I'm going to just keep referring to it as a tool because actually I think that's more accurate. Um, so now let's go, go a bit beyond um, and talk about gravity. Uh, obviously, if you're talking about vacuum energy, you should be talking about gravity. And my subtext of this talk is I'm going to be thinking of tunneling from positive vacuum energy to zero, but that's simply because I can draw the pictures for that easily. It's, it's by no means uh, the results I'm saying are not exclusive to that choice. It's simply a very pictorially easy one to do. So if we have gravity, we get De Sitter space, which can be represented as a hyperboloid embedded in a space-time of one higher dimension. So that's what this picture is meant to represent with different um, coordinatizations. Um, now, of course, we always have to sort of 
I think how much you just take this, accept this picture, it depends on, you know, what you think about quantum gravity. But, um, you know, it's true. I, I'm not assuming we have any particular theory of quantum gravity. All I'm assuming is that we, we have a sort of set of rules that we use when we are talking about quantum effects in gravity. And so we tend to be well below the Planck scale. We assume space time is essentially classical and gravity contributes through sort of quantum effects of the wave via wave functions of fields. And then these somehow back react, um, which is often where problems start to arise. But this, this sort of uh, philosophy is used uh, when we do black hole thermodynamics, cosmological perturbation theory. Um, and so in this case, we're using it to think about uh, non-perturbative solutions, but, as, but again, well below the Planck scale. So it's all sort of part and parcel of a particular toolbox that we use. So, um, so that's really, then this toolbox um, often is, is called, if you like, the Gibbons-Hawking Euclidean partition function approach. So we, we simply sort of take the path integral, we add in the Einstein-Hilbert term. It's a little bit dicey because even when we find a saddle point, we have issues with fluctuations, but it seems, it, it seems to give us a lot of, um, of answers that we get via other means. So we, we sort of trust it with some caution. So I think that that's essentially uh, my position here in this talk. So again, I go back to that picture of the, the bubble, but in this case, I'm thinking of the hyperboloid as real uh, de Sitter space. And so if I wick rotate my de Sitter space uh, hyperboloid, I get a sphere. So Euclidean de Sitter space is simply a four sphere embedded in a five dimensional space time. So if I want to tunnel to flat space, flat space is just a flat surface. So all I have to do is I take my sphere and I just cut it at some point and I replace it with something flat. So that is what my instanton should look like, this thing uh, down in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, Right-hand side is the de Sitter sphere. The radius of the sphere sort of tells you about the cosmological constant. So this is what our instanton should look like, um, although that's not how Coleman and De Lucia thought of it when they actually constructed this instanton. So again, using this intuition of the uh, tunneling being represented by a relatively thin wall separating two different vacua, you get this, um, uh, you use the sort of standard Euclidean Einstein equations, and uh, you put a shell in, you solve the equations, and you get the answer. Um, but interestingly, you get the same answer if you were to simply look at this Goldilocks game and uh, ask what is the balance between the, uh, the energy of the wall, which is essentially the same as it was before, but the amount of uh, vacuum energy you've lost. And this looks a little different because, of course, it's not a flat uh, volume, but uh, the sort of tip of the sphere. But you get the same sort of uh, answer. So you've got the same idea, too small a bubble recollapses, too big doesn't quite work. So there's a just right bubble and the just right bubble corresponds to this um, Euclidean Einstein uh, solution. And so our instant on action has a very similar uh, format. I've just written it down here, but it's, it's quite consistent with the um, non-gravitating back reaction bubble. So you send G to zero, you actually get the same answer, although it's slightly misleading there, but there's G's hiding all over the place in that formula. So if you put it, plug in the numbers for the standard model, it's what gave that insanely long half-life. And so nobody really, I think, was too bothered about this. Um, but uh, when Ben Withers was, who's a postdoc at Durham, we were chatting over coffee. Uh, we, we started to sort of think about how so many, uh, tech, so many of our uh, methods when we do things theoretically are very idealized. And I think that's largely because we've um, 
at least certainly in the 70s, we had to do so much analytically because our computational power was, was so rubbish. So we would tend to look at what we could do uh, rather than uh, fantasize about what we couldn't do. Um, however, in this case, this is one of these sort of interesting situations where uh, we can actually do a little bit, a little bit more. Um, and I think the intuition here comes from first order phase transitions. In nature, uh, when you have a first order phase transition, I mean, usually, admittedly, it's classical, but nonetheless, um, it often is, well, almost always, actually, it's not just a pure phase transition, it actually is nucleated, it's catalyzed by seeds. So, um, you know, for example, rain, raindrops tend to uh, be sort of cluster around dust in the atmosphere. Um, and so this notion of phase transitions being messy in nature is, is really very different from that Coleman picture. And so we kind of discussed what would happen if we threw a black hole. Um, now, this, this was actually thought of at the time, throwing a, uh, a black hole to, to the Coleman de Lucia process. But um, there was sort of, I think, perhaps two... Um, two things that, that were maybe missed. Um, one is about whether this is in fact the most, most general solution. And the other is in computing the Euclidean action. So I'll kind of try and cover that. So this is the paper with um, Ian Moss and Ben Withers. Um, so if you assume, if you look at your bubble and you're asking what is a solution for a spherical bubble, that has a lot of uh, symmetry from a space-time perspective. And what that means is you know what the exact solution is in Einstein gravity. Um, and, and so you know that the only thing, if you have that symmetry that can happen, is that you have on each side of the bubble, you have a two different vacuum energies and potentially two different black hole masses. So the general solution has a black hole mass so in fact, Coleman de Lucia uh, could have <laughs> could have found that at the time, but I think most of these results happened, uh, you know, much later, ten or twenty years later. So it was one of those things where at the time they they may not have they wouldn't have spotted this. So this is it's exactly soluble, and you have a bubble centered around a black hole of mass m minus. Um, with the lower vacuum energy and outside, you have a higher vacuum energy and an M plus. Now, of course, there's no black hole present in that picture that I've got on the screen here, but the idea is M plus would have been the black hole mass that seeded this, uh, this bubble, this decay. And locally outside the wall, your local tidal forces, your local Riemann tensor has an M plus in it and not an M minus. So that's kind of what that means. So in terms, of, so we, we kind of plug that number in, we crank the handle, we've solved the Einstein equations, we got a, um, a sort of equation of motion for the, the sort of how big the bubble was. Um, and then we saw that for a given seed, you could have a range of different uh, remnant masses, the M minus. Um, and in general, the solution would depend on Euclidean time. But so that's the thing that goes up in that picture <laughs> the bubble. So uh, but for each seed mass, there was a unique solution which had the lowest action. And given that you're exponentiating the action, this would be the bubble that would dominate um, dominate, if you like, the saddle point. Now, if you have a very small seed mass, actually, it turns out this is essentially subplankian, sub then um, the rem there would be no black hole remaining inside the bubble, um, and the you know the, this would be time dependent. So it would be like a perturbed Coleman de Lucia bubble. But for larger seed masses, uh, you find that the lowest energy solution doesn't depend on Euclidean time, and it has a remnant black hole. And in fact, this is the relevant one for standard model decay. And in this case, if you crank the handle, um, and I'll have to refer you to the, to the papers for that, um, the action is the difference in uh, entropy between the seed and remnant black holes. 
So uh, just to sort of give a bit of an illustration, uh, the balance of the action between uh, the, the sort of Coleman de Lucia form changes because you've changed the symmetry of your space time. Coleman de Lucia is O4 symmetric here. You've, you've kind of broken that because of the presence of the black hole. You have a sort of periodic time and then an, an a sort of SO3 remnant. So you get this L, if you like, the periodicity of Euclidean time coming in. And so there's a different sort of balance going on here. But as I say, the, the, the actual action is the difference in entropy. And that kind of um, corresponds to uh, this notion of uh, you know, process which is actually uh, reducing entropy should be exponentially suppressed. But what's interesting about it is that for a range of black hole masses, you find that seeding, seeded tunneling is far more likely than Coleman de Lucia. Now, before you conclude anything about vacuum uh, decay rates, uh, you have to sort of make sure that you're thinking about all other quantum effects that you have when you think about black holes. And of course, we know the black holes radiate and the temperature is inversely proportional to the mass. So that means their evaporation rate is power law in their mass, not some sort of exponential factor. So at first sight, you might think, well, evaporation is going to dominate over this tunneling rate. And so that means you need, you know, if the tunneling is going to be relevant, it has to be more probable or, or faster. The half-life must be less than the evaporation rate. So, of course, with these bubbles, what I've been telling you, the story I've been telling you is, been, is um, very idealized. It's got a thin wall. And if you want to construct a thin wall bubble in, you can't actually do that with the standard model potential. You sort of have to add an extra term to make the potential turn round again. So you're doing the Coleman tunneling from false to true vacuum and getting a thin wall. Um, and that's a bit ad hoc. So of course, you know, what we kind of did our proof of, um, proof of principle with thin walls, which was, largely analytical, but in order to really be confident that this was a problem, you then had to go in and integrate for the, inst the actual instant on with the actual um, standard model potential. And so what we did was we took a fit to the standard model potential and then, you know, sort of scanned through parameter space to see how, um, how this, this, what this instant on bubble looked like. So typically it's a very, very thick bubble. It's not at all like what I've been describing. It's more like a sort of very broad bubble um, around the black hole. Uh, what we noticed though, was that if we looked at this, these bubble actions, uh, we found that the seed and remnant masses tended to be very close, which isn't surprising because what's going to make the difference between, if you think about the spherically symmetric configuration, your M plus, your seed mass here, I've called it MS, your seed mass is just like the mass at infinity, the ADM mass, which includes the black hole and all of the Higgs cloud around it. Whereas, um, and so, so your remnant mass is just the sort of difference between that asymptotic mass and the cloud. So that, you know, looking at the, um, the, the sort of combined energy of the cloud, uh, because you are you know, well below the Planck scale, that's, that's relatively small. So, so it kind of makes sense intuitively. So the seed and remnant masses are close. So you can, and again, this, this is quite hand waving, but I'm, I'm doing this to give a, um, a sort of intuitive understanding of these branching ratios. Um, so using a sort of Schwarzschild uh, formula for the, uh, for the radius of the black hole, because obviously the entropy is proportional to this radius squared, uh, then this would give me, it's sort of like the seed mass squared minus the remnant mass squared. And so I can split that up into delta M and because MS and MR are close, I can just replace it with essentially two MS, that first bracket. So this is, this is really getting um, a sort of feel for what this action is doing. Of course, we, we did it in full, but 
anyway, this is just uh, telling you about what the exponential dependence is. And of course, the evaporation rate is um, power law. Uh, we also have a prefactor, which we estimated from the sort of light crossing time of the black hole. But the interesting thing about the evaporation rate is the prefactor is, whoops, is very small. So rather like sort of nuclear synthesis, where, where you get this sort of, uh, you know, suppression of, of um, you've got, I guess, the deuterium bottleneck, just because you have this, this, you know, normally you'd think that power law beats exponential, but if you have a very small prefactor, then, um, then, then that may not be the case. You get this sort of nice window in which the expo exponential can can actually dominate. And so that's what happens here. So here I've taken this uh, very dirty estimate for the branching ratio um, and just looked at how it depends on M and delta M. So here the, uh, the, the, the bottom axis is the seed mass in terms of Planck units and the, uh, the, the Y axis is this branching ratio. And so the different curves are for the different delta Ms. So black is 10 to the minus three, blue 10 to the minus four, and red dotted 10 to the minus five. So you see that um, you know, this branching ratio becomes huge. It's not just a few, it goes right up for this 10 to the minus five. And also, um, whereas for a something with thousand Planck masses, you might start to feel a little bit edgy about that, whether the semi-classical approximation should be used by the time you get between 10 to the five and 10 to the six. Um, I think that becomes much more uh, reasonable and justified continuing to use this semi-classical approximation. I mean, actually many people would count 10 to the three is just fine as well. So here is what we actually got in terms of a branching ratio, we are, this particular plot is showing you about where, you know, how we went from the thin wall that I talked about for the first part of the talk to the standard model thick wall. And you go from the, uh, the sort of brown and black uh, curves, which are superimposed on the left through to the um, purple, red, and then the solid blue curve, the solid blue curve is actually the standard model uh, curve, at least for some particular choice, I guess, or parameters. Um, and so you see so that as the wall minutes. gets thicker, yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> I think I should be fine. So um, as, you, as you make the wall thicker, uh, then you find that uh, in fact, that just makes things worse from the perspective of decay. So uh, let me just hustle up. So this is, uh, this is kind of a plot where um, if you go back, if you notice that the, these values on the bottom, you're, you're looking at black holes of sort of massive of like kilograms to tons, that sort of, that sort of um, range. Bigger black holes, for bigger black holes, evaporation weight, rate beats um, tunneling rate. So the only thing that can get you into that range is a primordial black hole. And so what this does is it does, it places bounds on the allowed mass range of primordial black holes, because if they had a mass at formation where they would be evaporating now, then um, essentially, it, you know, they would, they would, unless they evaporated with it, say a redshift of two, then most, you know, the, the sort of population of primordial black holes would then uh, have essentially catalyzed decay, the bubbles would have collided and we wouldn't be here. So it, it does give us a, a sort of a rough bound on, on the primordial black hole mass. So um, I just wanted to give this one slide which was more just sort of a little bit open-ended and, and thinking about, about you know, the method, if you like. Um, a key ingredient of this calculation is Euclidianization and talking about periodicity. Um, I didn't talk about uh, what the, the real difference between our calculation and the ones back in the 80s and 90s, which is uh, the computation of the action of a, uh, a singular instanton, 
But that is just what you have to do if you're computing, you know, doing that integral. Um, so I think trusting this Euclidean approach, which presumes thermal equilibrium in this situation is, is a bit questionable, it's uncomfortable because, but then trusting the Euclidean partition function approach for any black hole, when the black holes are not in thermal equilibrium, they evaporate away, is, is similarly uncomfortable. So I think I view this Euclidean approach as being, it's a tool, it's finding an answer, which, you know, if you didn't have this slightly more uh, uh, new situation, uh, you, people trust it when they're in more uh, symmetric or smooth configurations. And so I would regard this as, as saying it, it, it's giving us an answer, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's one where you've maybe got to this saddle point, um, you know, via some, some interesting route. And I think we, we definitely, um, you know, going back and asking, is this Euclidean, you know, can we find another way of getting this answer rather than doing this, this particularly, um, I don't know, unnerving approach. I think that that's certainly something that, that is a good, um, uh, you know, definitely a good open question. I know that um, also people have looked at uh, just doing tunneling uh, with sort of very high, you know, very high temperature black holes. And I think that's probably a good way physically of thinking about this. The black hole locally gives a huge distortion of space time and it's also locally at a high temperature and in a sense that is your catalyst of forming bubbles um, and so I, I guess I'm just saying that you know Euclidean methods are a tool and, and I think we really should be should be questioning this a little bit more so um, let me just finish with a summary I think vacuum decay is, is a good example of quantum effects in action with gravity we could tools, they're idealized. If you try and move away from the idealized situation, you get quite a different result. It's not a problem if you're looking at dark matter primordial black holes, but uh, it could have some constraints. My personal feeling is that, you know, there's definitely physics beyond the standard model, which will probably make this uh, metastab metastability uh, go away. But I think it's it's also been a really good driver for us to question things about the way we, we do these, you know, these calculations are not backed up in any way. And so one of the things that I'm involved in now is a consortium where we're, we're making analogs to test some of these ideas about the quantum vacuum. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, questions? Uh, Andre, go ahead. Yeah, hello, Ruth. So thanks, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, yeah, so I have the following question. So you said that for essentially for any initial black hole mass, which is which is larger than uh, in Planck, the least action solution is time independent. And uh, this this sounds very interesting because uh, when, when you see this uh, time independent solution, this kind of natural to think of it as a as a spheron, right? So the solution which which really represents the top of the potential barrier which separates a true and false vacuum. And uh, so so my question is: Have you thought of of a physical interpretation of this uh, time independence? So the time independence. I mean, I think. Um, that uh, there's been some, some other work, possibly by your colleagues, looking at tunneling around the black hole. I mean, I, I think you're, you're right. It is, a, it's much more, it, it, it does look like a thermal process. Um, so I think that uh, what I would really like actually is, is a non-Euclidean way of doing this. Um, so that, because I feel that would be closer to uh, answering your question about the physical process. I mean, I, I sort of mentioned that at the end about the Goldilocks bubbles, but, um, but I think with, with doing the bubbles, you do have to think about how you're then going to compute, you know, the action and the probability. So, um, yeah, so I don't know, when you said the this, this on there, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, our solution really 
I guess, does interpolate between the Sphaleron makes me think much more of a Hawking Moss type of instanton, actually. Maybe that's wrong, but and I didn't talk about that. But in fact, with um, um, Naritaka Oshita and, and Dian, we, we've also been looking at Hawking Moss with black holes. So again, you know, I think there's there's sort of quite a lot of interesting um, sort of interesting clues there, but it, but it's all, you know, it, it it seems to come back around to how we how we're thinking about tunneling in field theory and how we're computing things. So I think it's a good question. I, I'm not sure I've got a good answer. Thank you, uh, Shukso, please. Yes, thank you for the talk. I, I have a naive question. So you refer to these black holes as catalyzing uh, this tunneling. So catalyst is something that is unchanged in the reaction. But here there is a difference, if I understood correctly, between the initial and the black hole mass. So the black hole is actually not a catalyst, but it's changed in the reaction. So why is that? Why is there a different initial and final mass? Um, so I guess you would see it by thinking about um, the configuration, if you were to go back to um, Lorentzian space and just sort of freeze frame it, um, you would have uh, some sort of cloud or bubble around the black hole. And because that in itself is going to have some energy momentum, you know, in general, you're going to have two different masses. So it's just the generic case. There are uh, bubbles with um, where you get the masses being the same, but it's like an isolated point in parameter space. So there is a solution where the black hole mass doesn't change, but it's, if you like, a special point. The generic um, instanton has two different masses. Is there some easy way to understand why physically the black hole mass changes in this tunneling from one scalar field vacuum to another? Um, sorry. Uh, so, I mean, I guess I think about it as, as just being the fact that you've got an energy, energy balance and, you know, you start putting stuff around the black hole and you're changing, you know, the vacuum energy as well. I, I guess I just see that as being... As be, I see it as being very natural that the black hole mass would change because you're, you know, you're putting stuff around it. It's a bit like, um, you know, when in, in um, although this may not help us in Jewish, in ADS CFT, where you have a negative mass uh, scalar and you put a black hole in and, and the scale, it's energetically favorable for a scalar to condense and that can screen charge from infinity. So I guess... I regard it as, as sort of similar to that. You're getting some condensate around the black hole and therefore that can, can change the mass. I don't, I don't know if that, that helps. Thank you. I guess I don't regard yeah, the black hole mass as being sacrosanct, I, I don't know. Hmm. So uh, Arto, please go ahead. Okay. Hi Rose. Um, Hi. Got a very basic cosmology implication in question about the cosmological implications. Um, so if you have this uh, black primordial black holes of mass 10 to the 16 grams, um, um, I, I suppose if they're produced very early on, like during or at the end of inflation or so, um, they would initially grow because they would accrete um, energy um, from radiation and uh, matter around them. So have you taken this into account and how much, I, I, I haven't got any intuition about how much uh, that will change, but is the bound that you give on the, the 10 to 16, does it apply to the <laughs> initial so mass? Well, what time does it was it apply? That's a really good question. When I did look at this, so this was with Dejan uh, Dai and, and Dejan Stojkovic, I, I think we, we kind of just took the results from the primordial black hole literature. Um, and, it, you know, that's a really good question or two. I am not sure whether uh, those guys have actually thought about that in the sense of, you know, do they do they have the temperature going up, uh, sorry, the mass going up and then down, or do they just take that initial starting point and then do the standard sort of, uh, you know, um, 
evapor you know evaporation part uh, particles i you know i have a feeling but well, i may be wrong so apologies if i'm wrong but i have a feeling that that has not been taken into account okay thanks thomas Russian. Uh, we can't You're hear muted. you, so maybe, maybe you should un unmute ah, yourself. Sorry. Okay, uh, just one quick question regarding your result, and in particular the dependence on the masses of the black holes. So what I don't really see is how the properties of the Higgs potential enter it. And in particular, to show you where I'm trying to go, I recently calculated the lifetime in a flat space time. And what I found, as everybody else, is of course that there is a very strong dependence on the quotic coupling, and therefore also an enormous error bar. And yeah. I wanted to check whether this maybe also occurs with your approach, because you never mentioned it. It, it does. No, I, I apologize. I think I was trying to focus on on sort of uh, talking about, um, you know, the the sort of essence of the instant on without the, the details but you're absolutely right what we actually did as a, you know so as i said we took i, I don't know if i've got uh, i probably have to stop sharing to find it somewhere else we 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 fitted sort of the running potential right uh through for first of all we did the fit for that which allowed us by sort of changing uh, parameters in this fit to go between the different masses of the top and to kind of scan through um, a parameter space where, you know, where sometimes it would fit for 172 mass top or 174 um, or 170, where, where you don't get obviously the metastability. Um, and and so, so we did do it for standard model realistic potentials. And what happens, uh, let me just, I, since I haven't got it, I'll just try and, uh, Ah, how do I get there? Um, so as you lower the mass of the top, the, the uh, curves shift to the left here, okay? So, um, and, and, and also we, we kind of did a, a, tan, uh, a transverse, uh, we, we went beyond, you know, beyond, the sort of standard ranges for the for the standard model potential. So we did kind of, you know, have a little um, a little sort of explore through parameter space. But essentially, as the top mass drops, you get your meta, you know, your metastability is 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 sort of less, um, and these curves shift to the left. So it, yeah. But isn't it kind of? I mean, I find it very remarkable that. It seems to me that your decay rate is only fluctuating by like 10 orders of magnitude, whereas in flat space, you would get like a few hundred orders of magnitude as an error bar. Hmm. Well, this is this is the branching ratio. So it's comparing it to the instantaneous evaporation rate at that point. I'd have to go back and dig in to see what the actual tunneling rate difference was. Because I mean, I would guess that the evaporation rate should not really depend on the like should not be so sensitive to the top mass, right? Oh no, no, no. The evaporation rate is simply this is what's happening. It's what it's like one over m cubed. Um, so in in terms of the um, so it, of course it's not dependent at all. Uh, but but you're comparing it. You know, I, I think what I was saying was that as you shift these curves to the left you're changing the mass. So you're changing the evaporation rate with which you are comparing your local tunneling rate. So I think to just take the number, you know, say the top of the blue is 10 to the 12, the top of the purple is 10 to the nine would be a little bit misleading. You'd also have to weight that by the mass difference, which is here, uh, I don't know, a bit over 10 to the four and round about 10 to the six. So you cube that, let's say it's 10 to the four, 10 to the six, so that's 10 to the two. So that's an extra six orders of magnitude. But, but, but you're right, it's sort of, you're talking about um, nine orders of magnitude there, yeah? So... I mean, and that's, and I, I hope that's right. That was just a quick estimate to answer your point. Okay, and do you, I mean, as I asked, do you know, 
is there any point, is there any reason why this Aruba is so much smaller? Because I find obviously this more appealing than the other oh, case. I haven't put, we haven't put, please, uh, we haven't put Aruba okay. on me, sorry. sorry. <laughs> this is very, you know, um, but a very good point. Thank you, Alta. Yeah. Very good point, Arabas. Thank you. <laughs> I thank you. So we have time for one more question. So, Valerie, please go ahead. And we can continue in the breakout rooms. I'm sorry yeah, about that, it's, Alessandro. It's, yeah. it's worth also have a question from Alessandro, but anyhow, uh, <laughs> he always asks the smart questions. But anyhow, uh, Ruth, in the Hi, conventional, conventional picture, uh, if you go back to uh, Minkowski, Minkowski domain, then you see the domain wall that, and, and do the analytical continuation. Then you see the uh, domain wall stretching out and uh, so that you have the uh, new vacuum filling all the space. Do you see that in your picture? I, I don't know if it's me that's, but I didn't quite catch all of that. Yeah, okay. I let think me, it's let me, let I me, do apologize. Me, My me. Let me ask again. In, in the conventional picture, if you Yeah, go, I think I heard you asked whether it filled the whole space. Yeah, yeah. you see the domain wall that stretches out and, you know, uh, and then you, you feel you, your new vacuum fills the entire space. Do you see this picture also in your calculations? If you do the analytical continuation back to Minkowski? So you only see it. Huh? So you see it if, you're, if, you're, if your false vacuum is Minkowski, then you would see that, yes. But no, if your I'm false vacuum about, is the I'm talking center, about real solutions with black hole. If you continue them back to, uh, to Minkowski's signature, do you see the domain wall that's yeah. out? Spherical domain wall. Yeah. So, so the so initially, it's static, but then it it's not stable because we looked at the negative modes. But half of the time, it will it will destabilize and do as you say, and half, well, half of the time it will recollapse. So it's, if you analytically continue the actual exact solution, it would be static, but that is not going to stay that way. So, so we get the expansion more by, an, you know, a negative mode where the thing just, starts to expand. So the picture is through... the Sphereron, right? That's what happens with Sphereron. That was the first question, yeah, thanks. Okay. okay. Yeah. So we, we still have some more time. So Alessandro, please go ahead if it's not too long of a question. No, maybe it's too stupid, but uh, so if I understand correctly, your black hole, your good black hole is a Svarzi radius comparable to the inverse uh, instability scale of the standard model potential. Uh, now, this is what the, the plot now on, on the screen uh, probably is showing. Uh, so then uh, if, uh, so, so the question is, uh, what happens if a black hole radiates uh, Higgs uh, with energy above uh, the instability scale? Uh, is this dangerous uh, or irrelevant? Uh, so I think I, I'm not sure about the first thing that you said. You said something about the black hole radius being, sorry, could you say it again, please? Oh, so I suppose the uh, radius, uh, Schwarz radius of the black hole must be comparable to the instability scale. Is that right? Uh, so um, if the instability scale, for example, is five, five orders of magnitude below the Planck mass, uh, you need the black hole mass five orders of magnitude above the plan scale. I'm not totally sure if that is correct, actually. It looks to be broadly correct. I agree with you. Uh -huh. It does look to be broadly correct. I'm just not confident that it is actual. You know, if we if we went and we looked at our instantons and I... I I sort of have a feeling they it wouldn't be precisely true. It would only be broadly true. But, yeah, broadly, but let's proceed yeah. as saying it's broadly true. And then you're saying, 
well, the black hole is going to be rating, radiating all sorts of junk once it gets down to that scale. Is that a problem? Um, I'm, I'm not sure it is, but, I, but I'd have to think about that. I think it's a good question. So okay. sorry for not having an answer. <laughs> Okay, probably it's a stupid question, but okay. No, I don't think it is. I think it's an interesting one. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Okay, so thank you. Not having an answer. <laughs> so I will stop sharing. So let's thank Ruth again. Thank you very much. And uh, we can now move to the final uh, talk for the morning session by Artur Ajantia. Uh, that will talk to us about cosmological implications of the Higgs vacuum metastability. Hey, thanks. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Yes, everything is fine. Please. Okay, good. Okay. Um, yeah, so thanks um, for the opportunity to speak. And also, um, yeah, it's really um, nice to have this, have my talk after after the two others because it basically follows up uh, on what um, what has been was what we have been talking about. I will be focusing on the cosmological implications of the of the uh, vacuum instability in the standard model, and um, I will not be uh, talking specifically about uh, black holes. But um, clearly, if primordial black holes are produced, then um, that will be part of this discussion of cosmological implications. So in this talk, I will, I will assume that no such um, uh, dangerous primordial black holes are produced. Uh, this talk uh, is based on um, largely on, on these works uh, I've done with um, um, various collaborators over the last eight years or so. And I would just like to point everyone to the uh, to the review article um, we wrote um, which is now four years old but still has lots of uh, lots of um, uh, the stuff in it and just um, I mean this was already mentioned um, so I will just briefly remind everyone that um, what we are talking about is that in the standard model um, if you look at uh, if you take the experimental values of the Higgs and top masses um, then Look at the running of the couplings, specifically the running of um, of lambda, the Higgs self coupling. It goes negative at around 10 to the 10 the GeV. Uh, the values I've got here for the uh, for the masses are, are obviously a bit um, old, but um, the conclusion is still qualitatively uh, the same. And um, and so what that means is that um, the even you take the running coupling. Uh, you can approximate the quantum effective potential of the Higgs field using the renormalization group improvement. Essentially, um, it's a good approximation by just uh, choosing uh, the renormalization scale to be a coupling times, um, times uh, the Higgs value. And therefore, it follows from the fact that if you go to higher scales, it goes negative. It means that the effective potential goes negative at uh, field values um, above 10 to the 10 at GeV. And um, presumably or possibly there is another, an, another minimum in the potential at some higher value, but within uh, the validity of the standard, whereas a below Planck scale there isn't. And so therefore, if there is a true vacuum uh, global minimum in the potential, then that is at the Planck, Planck scale, or there is some new physics that changes this either uh, below the instability scale or above it. But I will be in this talk, I will be assuming no new uh, particle physics and th therefore uh, looking at the implications of this if this picture is correct. Um, and of course, if you have a global negative global minimum, then it's possible to have quantum tunneling uh, through the barrier and, um, and, um, and therefore uh, that's where the metastability comes from. To, to a good approximation, the tunneling rate in Minkowski space can be calculated by just finding uh, the instant on um, which, um, because the running of lambda is, um, is, is only logarithmic, then you can actually, to a very good approximation, just approximate it by a negative constant 
uh, Valley value. And for that case, the instanton solution was found already um, in the 1970s by Fubini. You can find it analytically, it's very simple. And, uh, the, and the action is given by, uh, the, given by one over uh, the coupling. And therefore, from that, you can get a good estimate for the, um, uh, for the instanton action and therefore the tunneling rate in Minkowski space, that it is uh, something, some dimension full number times exponential of minus 1800. And, um, and that is, of course, as was discussed, um, uh, highly dependent on the precise values of the Higgs and especially the top mass, but still it is a large number. And so therefore the rate is extremely slow. And therefore we can say, okay, uh, we are safe. But what I will be talking about in this talk is in some sense, is that actually enough? And what is it, what is it that we should be comparing this with? I mean, when, how slow is slow enough? And, um, and in fact, when you really think about it, um, uh, you should, should not uh, be asking just what uh, the probability of vacuum decay is today, but you should uh, think about the whole cosmological history. And that's where the cosmological implications really become um, uh, important. And I will assume in this talk that when a bubble uh, is nucleated, so when you have this kind of a vacuum transition, then uh, when you have a negative energy inside the bubble, it means that the bubble will grow at the speed of light and it, that it will destroy everything uh, it heats. So you get the exponential, you, you get a bubble wall growing at the speed of light, which destroys everything and um, the space inside it um, uh, collapses to a singularity. Now, there are arguments that uh, this picture is not quite right. For example, the recent paper by De Luca and collaborators. I will not discuss that. I will be basing, um, uh, basing my talk on this assumption, which I think is the general consensus um, uh, that this is what happens. But so if this is the case, uh, then if there was any bubble uh, formed anywhere in our past light cone, um, it will hit us and um, our current location in, in the universe would not exist because it would have already collapsed uh, in, into singularity. And so therefore from this, we can conclude that there cannot have been any bubbles anywhere in our past light cone. So it's not enough to say that the vacuum is stable today. It had to be stable, uh, sufficiently stable everywhere in our past light cone so that we did not uh, have any bubbles produced there or otherwise we would not be here. And um, this argument can be obviously then made more precise. So you can really calculate what is the probability in any given theoretical scenario that there were no bubbles produced in our past light cone. And um, if you assume a Poisson process, which uh, you can because uh, you're talking about only one or uh, no bubbles, um, then uh, the probability is just given as exponential of minus the expectation value of bubbles being produced in our past light cone. And that expectation value is very easy to calculate if you know uh, the rate per space-time volume. And um, it's given by integrating over the past light cone. And uh, so specifically, we have this um, kind of an integral where there's a geometrical factor. This integral is over um, eta, which is the conformal time. And A is the scale factor. and um, and so we just integrate this, and the integrand is a, is a product of a geometrical factor, which depends on the cosmological history and the time dependent um, nucleation rate, which is of course different at different stages uh, in the evolution of the universe. And this integral has to be less than one because otherwise um, the probability that there were no bubbles in the past light cone is very small, exponentially small. So that's what we want to do. We want to, uh, we want to estimate what the nucleation rate is at any given time in the history of the universe, and then do this integral, compare it to one, and see if, um, if that's less than one, in which case um, we, that scenario is compatible with our existence. Now, there may be people here uh, who are objecting to this 
starting point by saying that of course it's perfectly possible that there were bubbles being formed in the i mean that of course if there was a bubble if, if there had been a bubble formed in our past light cone i would not be here at giving this talk and so therefore from anthropic perspective uh, that is not really um the relevant question we can't uh, we are already by being here we are selected uh to, to live in a light cone where um, there were no bubbles. And fair enough, we can take that into account, but we, I, I will still argue that we can, we can do an experiment. So we can ask, what is the probability that there's no bubble that's going to hit us in the next, let's say, 10 seconds? And um, those bubbles that would hit us in the next 10 seconds are are produced at the very edge of this light cone, but they can also come at any, any um, time during the history of the universe. So for that, uh, the quantity that we are just talking about is dn, is n is the expected number of bubbles, dn over dt times the time period we are looking at. And because the numbers we are dealing with are so large, actually, um, it doesn't matter whether the delta t here is 10 seconds or, or 10 billion years, uh, the constraints you get are pretty much the same. So let's do this experiment. So um, let's see, next 10 seconds, are we going to be hit by a bubble? So we'd start now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. We are still here. And so therefore, from this experiment, we get the constraint on, on the nucleation rate and integrated over uh, the surface of our past light cone. There may still be people here who object to this and say that if that there may have been branches of the wave function where we were hit by a bubble and we just live in the branch um, which survived and okay that's a valid uh, philosophy but then you are uh, essentially a quantum immortalist and you can uh, yeah, apply that argument to any kind of a process where you would uh, you would uh, die and so if, but if, if you if that's your philosophy then i don't really have anything to say to you except that you can go make a coffee because there's nothing in this talk i will be assuming um, that we would that we can assume uh, that this um, does not uh, that uh, this does not happen so this is the assumption uh, i'm um, i'm basing basing this on and um the first, if you go backwards in time, of course, the first period is um, the current late time uh, universe. Sorry. Uh, current late time universe, where indeed uh, the, uh, the lifetime is very long. Uh, the relevant question, the relevant, the contribution from the late universe uh, to this integrated um, number of bubbles is um, 1. Uh, uh, 1 to, uh, 0.125 uh, over Hubble rate to the fourth. And you calculate that and you find that um, uh, it's either that for the central values that we, we've got, um, we are very much in the region where um, the lifetime of the, or where, where this uh, expectation value of n is much less than one, and therefore um, we are in the metastable uh, region. Um, and then this is, of course, um, what, you, what what people normally look at. Um, and I will in this talk I will be looking at uh, more the earlier stages of the of the history of the universe. But I will also um, add one more ingredient. Uh, in this discussion, and that is the non-minimal uh, Higgs curvature coupling. And um, so in general, when you are, when you have a scalar field in curved uh, space-time, you can add a coupling which is just a constant times um, a Ricci scalar uh, times um, uh, phi squared, where phi is the field. And this is perfectly compatible with all of the symmetries of the standard model. And so therefore, if phi is the Higgs field, and so therefore, actually, in the standard model, um, you do need this if you want it to be a um, renormalizable theory in curved space time, you have to include uh, this term. And it has some coefficient xi, which 
you should just like all of the other 19 parameters of the standard model, you should be going uh, measuring rather than postulating and uh, um, giving the value uh, yourself. And so therefore that's what, um, so I will include this ingredient because it is something that when we are in curved space that we must, otherwise the theory is not renormalizable. And we cannot consistently just say it's zero because it runs um, with, uh, with the scales just like all of the other uh, parameters. So here it's just a running. But so the key point is that um, it must be included for the theory to be consistent and its value is largely unknown. And it's largely unknown because currently the Ritzy scalar is, is practically zero. It's so small that it's, it's almost impossible to measure uh, the value of the coupling in today's universe. Uh, there was a paper by Atkins and Calmet where they estimated um, what bounds you can get uh, from uh, the LHC data uh, on this uh, coupling psi. And basically it's uh, less, the absolute value is less than 10 to the power 15. So it is, um, an, it is a parameter of the standard model, it's a necessary parameter of the standard model. And basically from uh, particle experiments, we don't know its value at all. However, uh, in the early universe, the Ricci scalar was high, had a large value, therefore this coupling was important. And, and that's, uh, that means that we can try to use um, the different kinds of uh, physical phenomena in the early universe to, to constrain, uh, uh, constrain this value. And that's part of what I will be discussing. Um, it's also worth noting that even in today's universe, when you have uh, the uh, vacuum decay process, the in interior of the instanton spacetime is highly curved because you have a very high negative energy density. And therefore, uh, this coupling does actually affect uh, the decay rate and therefore the lifetime of the vacuum. And here you can see um, how it changes the boundary between metastability and instability different values of xi. So xi is a dimension for parameters so we would expect it to be of order one. You can see that uh, if, if it goes up to um, plus or minus 1000, it will move uh, the boundary between instability and metastability uh, by a noticeable amount. It will make, uh, it will make the vacuum more stable. It pushes uh, further into the uh, high, higher top masses. And um, it's in any case, this boundary is very far from um, uh, from the observable, uh, from, from the experimental values of the masses. So therefore, it does not have any direct effect on the conclusion, but it, it does have a noticeable effect on the rate. Um, going backwards in time, um, from the late universe, current universe, where uh, the conclusion, therefore, is that even including psi, uh, we are safe. The contribution from the uh, from the late universe to the expectation value of n is very small. Um, but if we go to the um, uh, earlier, we go to hot big bang, uh, post-inflationary thermal um, the thermal state of the universe, and then the high temperature will. Um, give you higher bubble nucleation rate. And that means that uh, the constraints are, the higher temperature you go to, the, the, um, the more likely it is that you get bubbles uh, being produced and therefore you get uh, stronger constraints on, the, on, on your parameters. And this was looked at by Delarose and uh, collaborators and they found um, this bound um, for the top mass as a function of the reheat temperature, which was treated as a free parameter. And you can see here, I've just put here in this plot, um, the dashed line shows where this um, boundary between, so this is a boundary between the metastability and instability. Uh, so temperature, high temperature pushes it down um, to where the uh, blue dashed line is if the reheat temperature is 10 to the 16 uh, GeV. If it's um, less than that, then um, we are closer, we are further up. But this is uh, the sort of highest the reheat temperature could uh, conceivably uh, be. And you can see that um, with this um, uh, value, we are actually 
starting to be quite close to the experimental values. So, so um, they're still fine, but if the top uh, mass was 174 GeV, then um, it would rule out scenarios where the reheat temperature, where the temperature of the universe was around 10 to the 16 GeV at any point. Okay, that's the thermal part. And then we go further back to inflation. And um, during inflation, there's a, again, possibility uh, that um, you get uh, bubbles nucleated by different processes. So that has to be looked at uh, again uh, differently. Um, one very uh, common way of looking at it is the um, uh, stochastic starobinsky yokoyama approach, um, where you think of, um, think of uh, the, a Higgs field or any scalar field as being essentially a classical field with some stochastic noise. And um, from that calculation, you can, you can find that the probability distribution of a scalar field during uh, inflation or in the sitter has given by an exponential of minus the potential. And if it just put in a three level Higgs potential, uh, then we find uh, that the amplitude of these inflationary fluctuations of the Higgs field is lambda to the power minus one quarter, to just basically one, uh, at times the Hubble rate. So the higher the Hubble rate, the higher the amplitude of the, of the Higgs fluctuations during inflation. And this now becomes uh, then, if you now include the renormalization group improved effective potential, means that actually the potential turns down at around 10 to the 10 GeV. And so therefore from this we conclude that if the Hubble rate was greater than 10 to the 10 at GeV, then you would have had Higgs fluctuations. It's a big enough to throw the field over the barrier and trigger the instability. And so from this, it seems therefore that you actually get an upper limit on the scale of inflation of around 10 to the 10 GeV. And uh, that seems like a very strong, um, uh, strong result. Uh, this is um, well below what the most common and simplest inflationary models would predict. However, uh, this does not include the effect of the non-minimal coupling psi, which is important in the early universe. And uh, specifically um, here, I've just got the... Um, so psi basically gives an effective mass term, an effective con contribution to the Higgs mass. And if you are radiation dominated era, then the Ritchie scalar is zero, so it doesn't do anything. Uh, but if you are in inflation, the Ritchie scalar is 12 times eight squared. So it's a very large uh, mass contribution. And therefore the Higgs mass, effective Higgs mass is during inflation is dominated uh, by this term because the, uh, the tree level term is 246, uh, sorry, 125 at uh, uh, the GV squared. Um, and, um, and so therefore this is actually, you can ignore uh, the three level mass, it's this term that, uh, that matters. And this was noticed already by uh, Espinosa and collaborators in 2008, that if Xi is positive, it increases the barrier height and makes the vacuum more stable. Correspondingly, if Xi is negative, it decreases the barrier height and uh, makes the vacuum less stable. And so therefore, Basically, from this, you can see that in order, if you have a high inflation rate, um, you can potentially stabilize the vacuum uh, by having large uh, xi. There is another factor that one needs to take into account, and that is that um, uh, when you calculate loop corrections to your effective potential, then uh, they depend on space time curvature. And what that means is that when you do renormalization group improvement, if your Hubble rate is greater than, um, than uh, the value of the Higgs field for which you are calculating your potential, then uh, the Hubble rate is the scale that you should be using rather than the Higgs field. And therefore for high values of the field, um, the effective renormalization group improved potential is just given as lambda with renormalization scale at the Hubble rate times phi to the fourth. If H is greater than 10 to the 10 GeV, then lambda is negative. And so therefore, what this means is that um, 
for high values of, um, uh, of the Hubble rate, there is no barrier uh, the, because uh, the coupling, uh, the, uh, the coefficient of the quadric term is, is always negative. And uh, that argument it was based on just um, uh, sort of a hand waving renormalization group argument, but we can actually do that um, explicitly to one loop. So we can just calculate what the effective potential is um, uh, for the standard model fields at one loop, uh, including curvature. And so we did that, and this is how it looks like. So indeed, um, at, at, at low Hubble rate, uh, the blue dashed line here, uh, you have a barrier, the Hubble rate increases, the barrier goes down. And eventually, when we are close to the instability scale, the barrier disappears. And so that means that actually, um, when you are looking at these high inflationary uh, scales, there is no barrier in the Higgs potential. It, the instability is a classical instability. And so that's basically uh, then the picture. Um, you do, therefore, in Minkowski space, you do have a barrier. But if you uh, go to um, the early universe during inflation, then the barrier disappears if the Hubble rate is high enough. But you can have an additional term uh, given by Xi, the non-minimal coupling, which reintroduces the, uh, the barrier. So basically, if Xi is less than 0 0.02 or so, um, you just have a classical instability, no barrier at all. If Xi is sufficiently large, uh, you have a barrier which is, can even be higher than in Minkowski. And taking this into account uh, during the calculation, we, um, we find uh, this uh, kind of a, a instability plot. So the, um, uh, this is as a function of the Hubble rate during inflation, showing which values of Xi are needed in order to stabilize the potential. And a, a new inst here is uh, the instability scale which for the values of top and Higgs that we were using is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the nine, but depends on those uh, numbers. Um, and we see that if the Hubble rate is high, higher than 10 to the 10 GV, then we need a positive uh, non-minimal coupling in order to be on the stable side. Whereas if the Hubble rate is sufficiently low, then of course um, we don't uh, have uh, that instability during inflation and uh, therefore we are fine even with negative neg negative psi but the blue so sorry the, the red areas here are are, are ruled out uh, by the instability whereas the green areas are fine um, uh, five uh, more minutes okay okay good um this um uh, there's also um one thing so this was assuming the sitter constant hubble rate and um, so we have uh, also looked at the dependence uh, on the, so we have looked at the case where the Hubble rate depends on time, because that of course is how real inflationary models, uh, models work. Here we still assume that the nucleation rate at any given time is uh, given by the De Sitter um, expression, but we assume that the Hubble rate uh, changes with some sort of adiabatic approximation. Um, we considered uh, three different inflationary models, Starobinsky-like field theory model, quadratic and quadratic chaotic inflation. And we find that in all of those, uh, the, um, uh, the most likely time when a bubble would be produced is at the very end of inflation. Then you just look at the geometrical factor and the, um, and the uh, dynamical factor in the in the front. So the most dangerous time is at the end of inflation close to the end of inflation. And we um, calculate the integral, obtain the bounds on Xi, and we find that actually quite interestingly for all of these field theory models, uh, even though they have very different potentials, uh, the constraints are very similar. And um, all of them basically require 0 0.06 or higher, um, uh, or otherwise uh, your, your, your um, you, you would be you would have a bubble and therefore you, your theory would be excluded. 
I've also shown here the dependence on the top mass. So if the top was as um, light as uh, 171 GeV, then um, we would not have any, any instability. Um, very briefly, um, this is based on the Hawking Moss uh, uh, instant, on which um, geometrically is just a sphere, it's a constant, uh, constant solution. When you are at sufficiently low, so at sufficiently high Hubble rates, the Hawking Moss instant on dominates. But at lower Hubble rates, you have the Coleman de Lucia kind of instant on which, um, uh, which was already talked about um, by previous uh, speakers. And, and in that case, because we now have a negative curvature in the true vacuum, a negative energy density in the true vacuum, it means that there is the interior of the bubble in the Coleman de Lucia has a negative curvature. So actually the Coleman de Lucia instant looks like this. So it's a sphere which has this kind of a bit with negative curvature. So it's, uh, it doesn't have the windows or the ventilation shafts, uh, but otherwise it looks like the Death Star. Um, and um, you can ask whether that um, instanton actually should be taken into account. We found uh, uh, those instantons numerically, including gravity. And we what we find is that um, uh, the Coleman de Lucia rate is always uh, so high. It depends. It does not, doesn't depend uh, on the uh, on um, on the Hubble rate. Um, if, the dependence on the Hubble rate is very weak and therefore um, uh, it's practically constant and practically the same as at uh, zero uh, Hubble rate in Minkowski and therefore so low that it never affects the bounds. So therefore the Hawking Moss uh, uh, results are the relevant ones for these bounds. I will hope I have time for a very briefly say that uh, there's also one further error which we have to take into account, and that is the transition from inflation to radiation dominated, so reheating. And, um, and during that time, especially if you have, so we found that uh, you need a positive uh, psi, positive non minimal coupling, in order to stabilize uh, the potential during inflation. But during reheating, especially if you have preheating um, coherent oscillations, uh, then uh, that means that you have uh, uh, this psi term here. The Ritzy scalar oscillates um, during um, during uh, preheating. It goes from a large positive value to zero, but it um, goes through a negative uh, stage, and um, and that means that your effective Higgs mass is negative for a period of time, inevitably, uh, uh, during, uh, during these coherent oscillations. And if R is negative, and if Xi is positive, then your Higgs mass is tachyonic. Higgs mass squared is negative. The Higgs starts to grow exponentially, and that can trigger uh, the instability. And um, indeed, that's what we find, is that there is, um, uh, if the Hubble rate is inflation Hubble rate is high, so we have to worry about the instability. Then, um, if psi is greater than roughly one, uh, then we have an instability. And so that means that actually during the end of inflation, psi is uh, constrained from above. Uh, this was done based on a very simple estimate. We did some lattice simulations with Danny Figueroa and Paco Torrenti. Um, where we looked at this, and this is just for different psi values, you can see that uh, the, this is the Higgs field, and you can see that if psi is too high, um, the basically greater than 12 for these parameters, um, we get an instability uh, transition to the true vacuum. Whereas if psi is, is lower, um, we stay in the, in the false vacuum, which we want. And so therefore we get a bound from this on psi from above, uh, because uh, the universe has to survive uh, this transition as well. What we found um, uh, was um, with our, our estimates and our assumptions that psi needs to be less than um, nine uh, for a simple chaotic inflationary model. It's interesting that very recently there was a paper um, where uh, this was looked at in Starobinsky inflation, and they find a much stronger bound um, basically saying that psi needs to be less than two 
or you trigger this instability at the end of inflation. So in Starobinsky inflation, it seems that there is a much uh, narrower range of Xi uh, that are allowed. In fact, we've, we are also looking at um, Starobinsky inflation during inflation. We find that the pounds are stronger from that side as well. So I think it looks like a general a trend that when you go from field theory inflation to Starobinsky inflation, these effects become stronger. Anyway, um, now uh, come to the end of my time. So let me just summarize what we found. So we found that uh, by considering vacuum instability in the cosmological setting, you have the key point here is that you have to take the whole cosmological history into account. You can't just look at the vacuum uh, decay rate today, because most of the bubbles that are likely to hit us are coming from uh, the early universe and not from the present day universe. And that can constrain cosmological models and that can constrain their parameters. And specifically, I focused here on Xi, the non-minimal coupling, uh, because that is a known existing parameter of the standard model. And I've assumed a very simple inflationary scenario. So no primordial black holes, uh, no coupling between the inflaton and the standard model, just normal chaotic inflation. And in that case, we get, um, we find uh, that Xi from these considerations has to be uh, within this range of 0 0.06 uh, to, to 9. And that's basically a 19 order of magnitude improvement uh, compared to the LHC bound on, on this parameter. And it's interesting that it shows that it has to be greater than, greater than 0, which is often seen as the minimal value for the coupling. There are some caveats, of course, in this. Uh, so this bound here should be should not be uh, taken as absolute. Um, we've assumed that there is no direct coupling to inflaton uh, between the Higgs and the inflaton. Of course, there can be. If it's large, it's going to change these um, these uh, uh, numbers. But what um, others have found is that when they include this, uh, still getting uh, the same result that xi must be less than the absolute value of xi has to be less than of order one. I assume no new particle physics that could stabilize the potential. And of course, if the potential is not unstable, then there is no bound coming from that. But I think it is worth uh, looking at what happens in the minimal scenario so that you can see whether you can use that as a motivation for any, any, any scenario of new physics. And then this assumes high scale inflation, at least 10 to the nine GeV, but then again, uh, that's what most of the simplest inflationary models assume. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice talk, Arthur. Uh, questions? We have a... Yes, Chiara. Hello. Thank you, Arthur. So my question is not very relevant, but I was wondering this LHC bound, I had the impression that for, for that you were assuming the value of the Ricci scalar in the universe now. So don't they take it that on Earth? It doesn't I'm sorry. much, but um, you know, R, the value of R when you calculate um, the LHC so what bound. Yeah, the LHC bound does not assume any background value for the Ricci scalar. It comes, um, essentially this effect, uh, the bound comes from the fact that if you have sufficiently large uh, Xi here, and you do a transformation from a Jordan frame, which has this term into Einstein frame, and then it modifies the couplings. It gives you a non, non renormalizable effective non renormalizable um, terms in the couplings and it suppresses um, suppresses the couplings of the Higgs with other other uh, particles. So it would change the way the Higgs decays into uh, other standard model particles. And because the decay um, of the Higgs is very much consistent with um, uh, uh, with with the standard model itself in its normal form, uh, then you get a bound on 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 xi, and so therefore it's not assuming any kind of a background value uh, for for the Ricci scalar. It's uh, more like uh, how it would affect interactions. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Misha, please. 
Okay. Yeah, hi Arthur, thank you for the talk. It's not actually a question, it's a remark uh, that uh, uh, the discussion which you had is not applicable to heat inflation, then everything changes, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yes, so that's a, I didn't say that explicitly, but yes, that's a very important point. So what we are assuming is indeed that there is a separate inflaton field and a separate Higgs field. They don't couple, there's no direct coupling between them, and they certainly are not the same field. If you are looking at, um, at Higgs inflation, everything is very different because, so here essentially the assumption is that the Higgs field has fluctuations around zero. In, in Higgs inflation, the Higgs field has a very large value, and therefore um, these, uh, nothing I say can be translated um, directly to that, and it's a diff completely different calculation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Huri, please. Uh, hi, Artu. Thank you for the interesting uh, talk. Uh, I have a um, short question and uh, maybe longer comment. Um, my short question is that uh, have you tried to put a constraint on uh, this parameter uh, zeta if uh, uh, from uh, gravitational waves? Uh, and and uh, I mean, uh, uh, more precisely from uh, radiation that comes uh, from around the black holes, uh, because uh, because uh, the the fact that uh, phi can change, its interaction can change. It can affect, for instance, electrons, and then uh, then the spectrum of uh, electrons and emissions and so on around the black holes. Uh, therefore, I don't know how we try to constrain uh, uh, in this way. Okay. Yes. Good question. So the short answer is no. Um, we haven't. Um, I have a feeling that uh, that the Ricci scalar, even in the black hole collisions. Um, so in, in the astrophysical black hole collisions, which are observable, obviously, um, the Ricci scalar is everywhere so small uh, that, um, and, and the Higgs field itself doesn't play a huge role. Um, so my gut feeling is that uh, it would not be, um, it would not be easy to, easy to detect the effect of this coupling, but uh, that's not based on any kind of a quantitative calculation and I think that's certainly something I don't know whether that has been has been looked at but I think that's uh, certainly something where one should at least do an order of magnitude estimate of how big the effect um, effect would be because that's an important question but as I said I haven't haven't yeah. looked at that myself okay thank you my 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 comment or sort of comment question uh, is that uh, even uh, in the case that we consider the minimum uh, model, just a standard model. Uh, the fact that, I mean, uh, the development of, it, uh, of um, Higgs condensate, uh, which then uh, leads to a sort of a spinorial uh, potential, uh, is not a straightforward. Uh, therefore, I I am not sure if, uh, and I am not sure that just uh, considering the effect of uh, running uh, coupling and mass uh, would be enough uh, to really judge about uh, about uh, the presence of a condensate of Higgs in the with the potential that uh, we know from uh, experiments um, is really. Uh, completely sure. I don't know if has been any attempt to really understand from quantum uh, quantum field theory how the the condensate uh, is developed and how it may behave at high energies. Yeah, I think there's a. Uh, I think there's a, there are two different approaches, two different ways, one, two, two different philosophies. Uh, one, two different ways one can look at look at this, and I think certainly if you look at it from top down, uh, starting from any kind of um, uh, assumptions about your high energy theory, then um, it always seems incredibly unlikely that you would get precisely uh, what we have with the, uh, with the standard model, because it is a very special set of parameters. And, um, and um, however, what I'm assuming is that we don't know 
what the fundamental theory actually is, but we, what we can see is, is the low energy effective theory, and that is the standard model, and then um, see how, what, if we take that simplest uh, scenario, what the implications of that is, so that we can then uh, judge whether there is need uh, for something else. So I'm taking that sort of bottom up approach in that sense, starting from what we thought we have got from experiments and seeing what how yes, far but, we can extrapolate but, but that. Anyway, uh, I'm not sure that experiments or uh, um, uh, can can determine really uh, the way that we, we are experimenting uh, uh, can determine how uh, the condensate develops uh, and give the mass and potential that we uh, that we observe. Uh, in the theoretical point, I don't know if people have tried to really do a, a, a very, I mean, exact calculation uh, from first principle to see how uh, the, the, the Higgs um, uh, potential develops, I mean, condenses. Well, I think, yeah, I think the question is, we don't know what those first principles are. If, if I understand what you're talking about, I think there's a clearly, so where the potential actually comes from. So. So we don't know what those first principles are, and therefore it's sort of hard no, but to... Even, even, considering, even considering just the standard model, uh, forgetting, I mean, the minimum, as you, as you mentioned in your talk, the minimum assumption, just a standard model, nothing else. Do we know how this potential is formed? Do we know the conditions for having such a potential? I'm not sure. Um, well, what we know is that it's consistent. So we certainly don't know why it has that form but it's internally consistent and therefore that's what i'm assuming okay guys uh, i'm sorry to interrupt the discussion Thank you. but there are still some questions and yeah almost time for yeah, okay we're over time but okay people are probably getting hungry so okay please go ahead you have a question no no problem no problem oh Okay, for, hi Arthur. Thank you very much right. for that nice talk. Please so, keep it short. Uh, Please keep it short. Yeah. Yeah. So how about the article the inflation? So I think you work on the Einstein frame, but how about in the, the coupling is made in the Jordan frame? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Couldn't quite catch that. So I you mentioned the Higgs uh, Starbinsky inflation, but I guess it is the the this nominal coupling is made in the, the Einstein frame. But how about we can have the, the, the nominal coupling at the, the third frame? Yes. So, so I, I guess the story would be different. Yes. So um, in um, in this paper, which I, so I, I'm not an author on this paper I mentioned about uh, Starobinsky inflation um, here. <laughs> in that one, they um, go to the Einstein frame uh, to do that to do that calculation, and. Um, when I referred to Starobinsky here earlier, it is um, should add so that's a Starobinsky-like Starobinsky-motivated model because what we are doing there is we are uh, taking the um, uh, potential that you would get in the Starobinsky model when you go to in, Star in Starobinsky inflation when you go from um, the original the Jordan frame to Einstein frame, mm -hmm. and therefore you get the inflaton field. We still assume in this work that there is no direct coupling uh, between uh, the inflaton you get that way and the Higgs. And um, in the full Starobinsky mm -hmm. theory, that would not be true. When you do the conformal transformation, mm -hmm. you would generate uh, couplings between the inflaton and the Higgs. This is something which um, yeah, yeah, yeah. indeed was done uh, correctly in the, in the paper that I mentioned, and also something that we are looking at. But this particular mm -hmm. work is does not include that effect. And so therefore, this is mm -hmm. Starobinsky okay. only in the sense of okay. the form of the potential. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Very good. So I see no more questions. And uh, yeah, we're a bit over time. But uh, so the organizers have some. Uh, yes. So uh, uh, we, we can. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we can. Uh, people who are interested, we, we can stay in the room for, for a while. There were some more questions. Maybe we, we didn't have time for them. 
Uh, if you want, we also can open breakout rooms, but I don't know if we if we really need. Look, we have uh, uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth uh, yeah, had to go because of internet problems. She managed okay. to send me a message. Okay. So we can we can continue here. I mean, uh, the yeah, yeah. Let's let's interested. continue in the in the common uh, in the yeah common room. Yeah. Sorry. Let's thank Artu again for the nice uh, talk. And uh, yeah. yeah, everyone that thank doesn't you. want to, to yeah. And let's uh, thank your, your, uh, Jorgos uh, for sharing this session. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thank thanks. you for... No, Andre, don't worry, come on. I, I couldn't leave you yeah, suffer. By the way, since we are done from the main session, can I, can I ask something, Artu? So uh, about about your, your approach, so you envisage somehow uh, that, okay, the starting point is, okay, coupling of Higgs to curvature plus some sector, whatever, Okay, you move to Einstein frame, inflationary sector, I mean. And then you say, okay, Higgs is much subdominant with respect to inflation. So I do some sort of, how to say, uh, approximation that uh, I can forget about whatever happens uh, yeah, due to mixings, because mixings are going to be there. Unless yeah. your starting point has mixings with Higgs, so your influence is not pure thing. It's not, a, you know, it, it's some, uh, something in that, that, uh, that involves Higgs as well, right? That, that's the logic? Yes, so the logic, yes, it is. So what we are assuming, um, I didn't say it explicitly, but in all of these calculations, they're essentially assuming that um, uh, that the gravitational sector, which includes the inflaton field, um, whether it comes from Starobinsky or whether it's just uh, postulated as a separate field, we are treating yes. them, we are, we are treating them as um, as classical backgrounds, and so therefore this is uh, really we are just looking at the standard model in that classical background, and um, and of course um, you can ask, and people have looked at to some extent what the effect of the interactions is, and so you and and possibly mixing. So you, of course, if you have mixing, you have to diagonalize your action and find uh, the um, the, uh, the actual correct uh, canonical degrees of freedom. But um, uh, but so especially with the gravitational um, degrees of freedom, that really only becomes important when usually uh, when you are at Planck scale and everything here happens well below Planck scale. So the instability yeah, scale sure, sure. is ten to the ten GV, and uh, and so that's the relevant. No, that's energy. what that's what I would expect as well. That's what I would expect. Also, I mean, it doesn't matter if, okay, you, you use normal modes to canonicalize, et cetera, it's irrelevant. They're very suppressed. That's what I would mm. expect. Okay. Yeah. See. Yeah. But yeah, so certainly when you when you do the, in the Starobinsky case, uh, we do have to look at this quite carefully. But yes, so certainly that's the, that's the final, um, final result in any case that uh, these effects are. Uh, no, but you, you see, you can you can engineer a situation such that your initial Jordan frame inflaton is a mixture of Higgs and Scalaron or whatever, in such a way that when you go to the Einstein frame, you make gravity canonical, you get rid of, okay, the diagonal mode is uh, really, you know, uh, free from Higgs, I suppose. It's all, yeah. It can always be done. It's not going to look nice, probably. But, uh, So actually, uh, I can comment on Suxi's question to Ruth uh, about why the black hole mass changes in the process of nucleation, but I don't know if he's still here. Uh, I am here. By the way, by the way guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna no, no. I'm gonna go for lunch now. So okay. yeah, see you okay. see you later. See you. Who is sharing? I'm not sharing Thank later, right? No, <laughs> no problem. No. It's a, Okay, okay, good. So see you later. Yes, bye -bye. Oh, am I still sharing? Oh, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, I don't see Suksu. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, he's so gone. Sure. So what, uh, Andre, what was your, <laughs> what would you have said? Yeah, okay, so so the question was uh, regarding Ruth's talk, right? So when they uh, started this um, black hole catalysis of working decay, right, with a gravitational back reaction taken into account and 
they found that uh, the mass of the black hole can change in the process of nucleation. And I think Suxi's question was about, you know, physical, how, how to understand it from the physical point of view, why it changes. And uh, I think there is very nice uh, uh, picture of it is, uh, uh, well, well, there are three ingredients. Uh, so the first is that uh, here uh, you work in uh, liquidian uh, formalism. So you really work with liquidian partition function, which kind of suggests that there is a sort of thermal equilibrium. So you have a thermal reservoir and black hole uh, surrounded by this thermal reservoir. And the second point is that uh, the solution which they actually found for any black hole mass larger than M Planck, but then I believe that that's uh, basically any black hole mass, right? Because if it's smaller than M Planck, then there is nothing to talk about. It's not. Uh, uh, so the solution they found is actually time independent. Uh, okay, uh, and this uh, actually suggests that this solution represents Sphaleron. Yeah, I think okay, that's so right. Uh, the, the the barrier between between the two working states and and then the the, the third key point which uh, she mentioned but uh, I think it was kind of went unnoticed but that that's I think is uh, really important is that uh, they found very simple formula for uh, the ex exponential suppression uh, they found that the, the action of this uh, bounce or, the, or this phaleron is just the difference between the black hole, the, the entropies of the initial and final black holes, right? And, and this really tells you this uh, very simple thermodynamic picture, right? So you can, so you have this thermal reservoir and you want to tunnel and you can borrow energy from, from the thermal reservoir. But uh, so, and in the limit of vanishing back reaction, when you know G goes to infinity, uh, so sorry, M Planck goes to infinity, uh, the black hole mass does, doesn't change, and it's like infinite thermal reservoir, and you can take any energy you want, right, to you know to tunnel, and, and this is just tunneling at finite temperature. I mean, we know that it's not a vacuum bounce; it's periodic instant on. And there is a fine, like a thermal interpretation of it, and and the same in the case of black hole. But but in the case of black hole, when you do take into account gravitational back reaction, you kind of have to take into account that this reservoir. The, the energy, you kind of deplete the energy of the reservoir, and as a result, the mass of the black hole becomes smaller. And I think uh, this is this is an explanation. And you really see this. You see that uh, the difference in the entropies equals the, the Sphaleron energy times T, or like divided by the temperature. This is really uh, this is really what happens. That that that's uh, that's what I think. But yeah. Yeah. So in in that case, so the for for the black hole, the if you have the thermal state, some, some effect, then the it, it's it sounds like you have the hotter Hawking state in, in mind. Uh, but uh, the ideal black hole would be plating, so the we expect it to be only vacuum. Okay, so that, do you exactly, have, do you exactly. That's else? my point. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah, yeah. Why, that's why I said that the first, the first uh, ingredient in this explanation is to really say that we work in a thermal state. So we assume hardly Hawking, that is, we assume a black hole, certain temperature, and it is surrounded by the thermal bath of the same temperature. So actually, okay. uh, 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 because you see in a really like, physically realistic case. So what, what would you expect, right? So you would expect that the largest catalyzing effect is achieved when the size of the black hole is of order of the size of the tunneling solution, right? Um, and uh, I think there was a nice paper by Dima Gorbunov five years ago also point, pointing out that. Uh, so, in the case uh, when uh, there is no thermal equilibrium and we just have a radiating black hole in vacuum or like in some you know environment with much lower temperature. And, and this is really uh, physically interesting case, right? Because in the case of Higgs vacuum decay, the instability scale is what? 10 to the 10th GV or so, hmm. right? So the size of vacuum bubble is really small. So we are talking about microscopic black holes here and if there are such black holes, primordial black holes in the early universe, they are never in thermal equilibrium, presumably. 
so we can safely assume that they are in vacuum. But then so what so is important, yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to say that what is important is a kind of, uh, so so it is true that uh, near the black hole, you have a kind of uh, hot uh, Hawking radiation and so on, and it is hotter, the smaller the black hole is, and you would naively assume that because it is so hot, uh, there are very energetic field fluctuations, and they throw the system over the barrier, right, and you would experience this uh, vacuum decay, and this is kind of consistent with this um, result by Ruf that uh, the least action uh, configuration is time independent. So it really tells you that you have kind of classical process, right? So you have uh, classical field fluctuations which throw the system over the barrier. However, yeah. uh, it is also important uh, what is important is that not only that you must have this highly energetic fluctuations, right? But it is important to have them in a, uh, you know, in a uh, large enough, you mean, uh, I, I mean, uh, the length of this fluctuation should be large enough, the size of this fluctuation should be large enough, right? Because they should, in principle, uh, they should be comparable to the size of the vacuum bubble, right? So these fluctuations, they should be coherent on a scale of the bubble. And, and, that, and that is what is not true in, okay. in this case of uh, evaporating black hole. And yeah. that actually, so we believe, I mean, so actually Sergei Sibirikov and me, we have now a couple of papers uh, discussing that. So we believe that, that that really makes a huge difference, that on the scale of the vacuum bubble, uh, in realistic, like in four-dimensional Schwarzschild uh, background, say, uh, the, 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 the Hawking radiation is already so diluted that it, it cannot really sustain uh, the bubble. So the critical bubble cannot form be, uh, ju just because of this uh, thermal radiation. There is simply not enough modes. Uh, that, that's but actually that, very simple. Yeah. Sorry, why is that not included? So are you saying that's not, uh, the, that therefore the con Ruth's conclusion is, is not valid? Yes. Uh, or, or... No, it, it, so it I, is valid. Yeah. So in my in, in my impression is that so the so the for the so in order to describe this this evaporate the system of the evaporating black hole, we need to describe it in the vacuum. But by performing the Euclidean uh, the weak rotation, the state I I suspect that the, we implicitly assume that the state is hydro Hawking. And uh, not only back in. So the so I I, I suspect to be the, the cause. So, so can we, we perform the big rotation going to Ukraine space? The the state the, the the initial state we consider for the for the black hole would be Hadro Hawking, but not not Ul Ul yeah. Ulbaki. Yeah, I think, so I this, think this, this is really and, yeah. and this is this I did yeah, this oh, is a little sorry. I I listened back on that uh, so, so do, do you mean uh, just to just, I want to understand what 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 it is that you are saying? Are you saying that the calculation essentially assumes that there is a thermal path which actually yes, exactly. isn't there because the yeah, black hole exactly. is not in a thermal path; it's just radiating uh, thermal radiation outwards. But there is no; it's not in thermal exactly. equilibrium. So Euclidean, yeah, so yeah. Euclidean so by, thermalism implicitly yeah. assumes. Uh, so uh, we, we have the we, we, we have the uh, periodic periodic boundary condition. But can we perform the the rotation? Then so it's, uh, it it is uh, it is likely that uh, the system is described the hard rock or the or the non evaporating static black hole. So the, yeah. in that sense, it does not describe the evaporating or radiating black hole. So, so if you had a, yeah, you know, a black hole in the Minkowski background, um, you would. You would have to do something different. You wouldn't uh, have this periodic uh, time. Well, because... In general, yes. Uh, so physically, uh, you could still say something like, okay, uh, still, okay, I, I have this. Uh, so strictly speaking, this is not thermal equilibrium. Still, I can still go to the, you know, to the vicinity of the black hole, right? And I know that because of centrifugal barrier, you know, I have uh, Hawking modes which are accumulated there. So it is almost, it looks almost like thermal bus in the vicinity of the black hole. And then I can perform my calculations there 
uh, and I expect it to be like almost uh, almost correct, right? But then I have to assume that you know the bubble the bubble should fit this vicinity of the black hole, and this is what is not true in, in, in when we go right. to this uh, Higgs vacuum decay and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So so indeed. So the Euclidean formalism it implicitly assumes that you're in equilibrium, and and you can actually derive it. I mean, you can start from uh, real time as a case uh, method. Yeah. You can start. Um, in, yeah. So we we have, we have we just, so yeah we we have not succeeded in address on the black hole catalyzed decay, but yeah. In any in any case, we have the, the new insights. So we decided to write a paper. So yeah. And this is a PhD uh, student study. So writing a paper would be important. So yeah, yeah. But um, actually, one one sort of related question, which I think this was very useful to uh, to understand this uh, about the assumption of thermal equilibrium, but um, which in some sense makes my question irrelevant to the real physical case. But if you had this thermal equilibrium case, so yeah, if you were looking at black hole. Um, catalyzing um, cat catalyzing Higgs uh, instability in a thermal uh, background with in equilibrium with uh, with the surroundings uh, then I suppose you should you not uh, even in that case uh, include thermal corrections to the to the Higgs potential which oh, that's are absolutely actually, true. yeah which are yeah. actually because in, in very this, high is, this is something here. I if the temperature is high and therefore these corrections are actually um, very large and would probably change the calculation. Yeah. So, yeah, indeed, this is something that my, I, I and my students did in, in the uh -huh. previous paper. And we found okay, that, I, so I that, if that we, someone had uh, done uh, it, yeah, uh, so it was you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 And, and the, 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 so, I mean, so in, in that study, we study, we still work on the nuclear form uh, as Bruce did. And we adjust thermal potential for the and and for the Ulu vacuum. And in the case of Ulu vacuum, if we go go far from the the, the the black hole, the temperature decreases. And taking into account that we found that the the for the bubble bub, for for the bubble it is it is sufficiently far from the horizon so that the temperature is small. As a result, the thermal correction does help to. Help to relax the, the, the catalytic decay. So catalytic decay rate is is still enhanced we, in, in this in this in consideration. So, so I mean that we we might expect that the the thermal potential would stabilize the potential Higgs potential, but the yeah. but, but the, 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 the such a stabilization is not is not effective when we go go far from the horizon. And it is that the indeed we found that the, the bubble the bubble Play, uh, bubble radius is far, far enough so that the thermal correction is negligible. So that we conclude that the thermal effect does not help the catalytic so gas. For, it's, claim. Does it depend on the size? But I, I, but so you're saying that for the at least for the relevant, is it for the most um, the smallest uh, black holes where? This effect, uh, I think, was what Strumia was saying. Um, the size of a black hole is uh, where, where where this um, catalysis effect is uh, would be the strongest is ten to minus five times uh, Planck mass. And uh, so, for that, those kind of masses, are you saying that's a subdominant? Um, the, the thermal yeah, corrections so are. Pa yeah. So, perhaps it would be good to, to just show my. Paper with uh, so yeah, this is something that should be a good figure to show, I guess. Okay, let me check. So, but it takes up the time. So, yeah, so, yeah it would be good if you, if you could look at my paper, you take up that. So, uh, yes. so mm -hmm. uh, there should be a comparison. Uh, okay. So, uh, yes. Sorry, I forgot a piece, but uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I. 
is uh, okay. So this would be a good picture. So the yeah, plus and box is uh, the is and without thermal thermal correction and so the, the just the calculation tells that it doesn't change much at all. Oh, okay. So they're almost on top yeah. of each other. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it won't. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. it yeah. won't change any of the conclusions. Okay. Well, that's uh, yeah. useful yeah. to know. If 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 we we, we believe that the Euclidean formalism, but, but now I and Andre discussed that we might doubt the Euclidean formalism because the, it is implicitly assumed that the summer is already summer state or the static static summer state. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah, so actually, uh, Koshe, I have a comment about thermal uh -huh. approximation oh. that you use. So act yes. actually, uh, so how it uh, was uh, historically, I mean, Sergey and me were first trying to work in the symbol approximation and, you know, to to formulate boundary mm -hmm. conditions uh, corresponding to the mm -hmm. UNRWA 